Calvary. It's great to have you here. We especially want to welcome our guests today and hope you'll join us for coffee between services. Thanks to many helping lead our worship. It's always a special time when Jack and LaVon Birk do a duet, so we're uh, looking forward to that, just a closer walk with E. We thank our director of music, Russ Bunker, for his music, and we thank Tracy Beeger, who will lead the children's sermon today. At our annual meeting two weeks ago, Calvary voted 123 to 2 to call a new pastor, Pastor Cassie Anderson. She said yes. And so December 16th, she will begin at Calvary, and we're so excited. On December 21st will be her first Sunday to preach, and we're going to have a little reception for her between services. I hope you can, you can join us for that. We express our sympathy to the night skis on the death of Tim's stepmother, Irene, this past week. Sad, sad time for them. Many of you know that Sandy Hubdy has struggled for many weeks now. We are co-sponsoring a benefit with Esser Plumbing on December 11th to help pay her bills. Um, we sent out, sending out a wire that uh, they got some very bad news this week that the fibrosis scar tissue basically in her lungs has reached the point where she will not survive this, this episode. So this is a very sad day for for um, the Hubdies. This... Today our Justice Journeys group is preparing to travel, that are preparing to travel to Guatemala next spring, are sponsoring a scrambled eggs with ham breakfast between services. I hope you will join them and help support their trip. I'm taking a couple weeks of vacation starting tomorrow. My daughter Johanna, who lives in Scotland, is receiving a very special award at the University of Edinburgh, and she calls and says, Dad, would you please come? Um, you're very important to me, but finally, I'm going. <laughs> She's even rented a kilt outfit for me <laughs> for the special thing. So I'm thinking of paying for the trip with autographed copies of my knobby knees. <laughs> so, uh, and then on the way home, I'm stopping off in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, to see my other daughter, Elise, who has just moved there from Germany. So I, I thank Pastor Carl Anderson and Pastor Ken Kirkowitz for preaching and taking care of pastoral needs while I'm gone. So, Carl, thank you so much. So let's take a moment now as we prepare ourselves for our worship. Please stand as you are able for the brief order for confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house. And for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Shall we pray together? God, who beat swords into plowshares, you remain faithful to the people of Judah when all hope seemed lost. Remind us that you always remain faithful, even when we cannot see it. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated, and we'll hear Jack and Levon sing Just a Closer Walk.
take my hand, Lord Jesus, take my hand. There's a race to be run, a victory to be won. Every hour, give me power to go through. Why don't you kids come on down? We're going to do the children's sermon now. You please come on down. Not too many. Oh, there are a few coming out. All right. It's great. Maybe I need to start bringing Thanks treats to, to the service. Huh? Awesome. Hey, guys. All right. Good morning. It's kind of cold this morning. I didn't really want to get out of bed. How about you guys? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so how many of you guys have ever heard of a man named Hezekiah? Never? Really? Yeah, yeah, I had to look it up too. So don't worry about it. No, a few years ago now, actually, in my husband's family, there was a little cousin born, and they decided to name him Hezekiah. Now, the backstory is these cousins have, they're about to have their ninth child, and every one of their children is named from the Bible, eight letters, and ends in A-H. So they have a Jedediah, and a Michaela, and a Rebecca, and an Ariana. And then when they had Hezekiah, it's like, Hezekiah, who's that? So I had to look him up too, so don't feel bad. But um, not generally a Sunday school lesson that, you, that we talk about a whole lot. But anyway, you might hear Pastor Phil if you're listening to the sermon, you might hear him talking about um, Hezekiah, who was a king, and he did a, did a lot of stuff, led an army, and was a great king, and he relied on a prophet named Isaiah. Ever heard of Isaiah? He's kind of a little more famous. And he, Isaiah, actually taught us a message about a Messiah that would come someday and save us from sin, and that was Jesus. So even way back then, Isaiah was talking about the coming of Jesus. But Hezekiah relied on Isaiah for a lot of his wisdom. And one of the things that Isaiah taught and that Hezekiah did really well was pray. You guys know what praying is? Right, yeah. And we pray sometimes like this, or sometimes we're praying when we're driving in the car. But Isaiah taught Hezekiah how to pray and rely on, the, on God. So I'm going to give you something today. We're going to talk about it for a second first. But this, I thought this was kind of a cool way to learn how to pray. Sometimes we don't know what to pray. Or are we praying the right way? And God just wants to hear from us. He just wants us to talk to him. So I thought this was kind of cool. It's called the five-finger prayer. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of this. It's the five-finger prayer. So can you hold out your hand? And this is how you do it. When you look at your hand... You take your thumb 
and that's closest to you, and that, that's supposed to remind you to pray for the people closest to you, your family, your kids, your, your mom and dad, your aunts and uncles. That's to pray for your family. Now, this one, this is your pointer. This is what you point at people with, right? Like, don't do that. But this is actually the one, it's, it's not about pointing our fingers at people doing stuff wrong. It's about people that point us in the right direction, like teachers, like um, Sunday school teachers, our school teachers, our doctors, um, our pastors, people like that. That's who we're supposed to pray for next, people that point us in the right direction. Now, this third one, do you guys know when you call that tall man? That's the tallest finger. This is kind of to remind us to pray. We won't hold it up by itself because that's not, not great here. So, um, so this is remind us to pray for people in authority like our president and people even in, in our state like our senators, people in government and authority and things like that. Now what about this one, this finger? Do you know what that one's called? Ring finger. Ring finger, right. We, that's our ring finger. And it's kind of known as one of our weak fingers because it's, it's, it's hard to just move this finger or, or get a lot of grip with that finger. So this is the finger that reminds us to pray for people that are weak and maybe sick, and we pray for those people. How about this one? What's this one called? Pinky. Our pinky, that's right. This is our little finger. What do you think that one reminds us for? It's, this is the last finger, and this is us. To pray for yourself. You should pray for yourself, too. But God likes, probably, when we pray for ourselves last, when we put other people, all these people, before ourselves. And we can pray for things that we need, or pray for help, or give thanks to God, or... Um, Pray for people that we want to get better. Sometimes they don't always get answered the way we want, but we, we still are supposed to pray. So I'm going to give you guys one of these. So you can take that back, and you can color it or write on it, or make notes about Hezekiah and stuff like, like that on it. I'm just kidding. I don't think you're probably going to do that. But you can color it. There's bags in the back that have little coloring uh, crayons in it, so you can... You can do that while you're um, paying attention to Pastor Phil's sermon where he's going to talk about Hezekiah, so you'll learn a lot more. Okay, will you pray with me now? We'll fold our hands for this one. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us stories like, like this one we'll hear about today, about King Hezekiah, that we don't hear about often, but it's a good story for us to be reminded that, that relying on you usually produces the best results. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Karen, before you come up, I'm going to do just a little introduction to our lesson, and then I'm going to invite Karen up to read the scripture. So in just a moment, you're going to read, going to hear a story about a very powerful foreign king who tries to scare the king of Judah and his people. In fact, This foreign king will try to talk them out of trusting God and prove his own might by looking at this path of destruction that he has made. The foreign king is from Assyria. The king of Judah is Hezekiah. And he will turn to the prophet Isaiah as he considers how to respond to this terrible threat. So Karen, would you please read our lesson? Our Old Testament reading today is from Isaiah chapter 36, verses 1 to 3 and 13 to 20, chapter 37, verses 1 to 7, and chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, a long reading from Isaiah. In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, King Sennacherib of Assyria came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. The king of Assyria sent the Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem with a great army. He stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And there came out to him 
Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, who was in charge of the palace, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder. Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah make you rely on the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me and come out to me. Then every one of you will eat from your own vine and your own fig tree and drink water from your own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Do not let Hezekiah mislead you by saying, The Lord will save us. Has any of the gods of the nations saved their land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of these countries have saved their countries out of my hand, that the Lord should save Jerusalem out of my hand? When King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was in charge of the palace, and Shebna the secretary, and the senior priests, covered with sackcloth, to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This is a day of distress, of rebuke, and of disgrace. Children have come to birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God heard the words of the Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God, and will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. When the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, Thus says the Lord, do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard, with which the, met the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled me. I myself will put a spirit in him, so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land. I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. The word of Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion will go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. The word of the Lord. Please rise as you are able for the gospel acclamation. Today's gospel lesson is from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 14, a reading from Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. The word of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
I think that scripture is kind of the Olympics for readers. And Karen, I'm glad it was you. But apart from the names which seem pretty foreign, this may not be the most unfamiliar situation even to us. To us. We may not have been through a siege, but we have all fought in the battle between hope and illusion. What can I believe in and hope for? And that sounds like an easy decision, but it's not. Because it often goes way against all appearances and wisdom. Last summer I was a wedding and an older man was a friend of the couple. We sat together over dinner. And he said he had no hope for our country or our world. He felt it just kept getting worse every day, and he despaired of the future. No hope. No hope. Absolutely no hope. If you had been there that day, what would you have said to him? Is there a future for our world, for our church, for our God? Is there a future for us? Let's remind ourselves of the bigger story that this story today about Hezekiah is part of. God has delivered the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt. He's created a covenant promise with them, brought them to the promised land, given them prophets and kings, and established them as a nation. But they are a tiny nation caught between the big boys between great world powers. There on the Fertile Crescent, when Egypt or Assyria or Babylonia or Syria, any of those people needed to go anywhere, guess who was right in their path and was going to get kicked around? And frequently it seems that these people of God wonder whether other gods might have been a better bet than this God they have. So in today's story, one of the most powerful empires in all of history has moved through this end of the Fertile Crescent and has destroyed everything. In 722 BC, Assyria was the superpower of the age. And just that year, they leveled all the cities of Israel, the northern kingdom. They leveled all the cities, destroyed their capital city of Samaria, hauled off the leaders, and killed most of the rest of the people. Even in the spectrum of cruel kingdoms, Assyria was the byword for cruelty. And this was the absolute end of this northern kingdom, the break off ten tribes, who split with Judah in its capital, Jerusalem, and went their own way. And now there was just one. Just one nation under God. Just two of the twelve tribes of Israel left. A struggling little nation with Jerusalem at its capital. And can you imagine the morning when people woke up? They knew this was coming, but they looked out their windows, out over the wall, and their looked like a million soldiers, tents, camped as far as the eye could see, and now it was their turn. A little sideline to this story is that this empire of Assyria, with its capital in Nineveh, is the very city which God called Jonah. Remember, remember him? Jonah. God called Jonah to go to that city of Nineveh and to preach repentance. But it was such a hated city. It had killed and mistreated so many people in its way. And because Jonah knew God was such a gracious and forgiving God, what do you think might happen if he preached repentance? God might forgive this city. And he wanted nothing to do with that. So he got on a ship that went the other way. 
This is how people felt about Nineveh and the empire of Assyria. And so now in 701 BC, we find the Assyrians surrounding Jerusalem and threatening to destroy the city. And we hear the Rabshakeh, one of the major leaders of Assyria, and he is trash talking. Trash talking the king and its God. We hear the story both in 2 Kings 18 and 19, so it's told two different places in the Old Testament, and then in this book of the prophet Isaiah. And there's an interesting little scene where these people have gone out a little peace party to talk to him, and they say, could you speak in Assyrian, please? Okay, Aramaic actually was that language. And the Rabshakeh said, no, I speak Hebrew, and I want those people on the wall to hear this. So the leaders did not want the people to all hear what was going on, but the general wanted the people of Israel to hear this trash talking. To really terrorize, the general sowed seeds of doubt about their own leader, Hezekiah, and about their God. Don't listen to Hezekiah. He can't save you. Neither will his God. And then he reminded the Hebrews of this path of destruction that he had made. Nobody could withstand them. And hundreds and hundreds of cities had not only been conquered, but leveled to the ground, their people killed, some few of them sent into slavery many, many miles away from where they, they had lived. And so it was as if these cities had never, ever existed, including their brother nation's capital city of Samaria. Virtually nothing left from it being conquered. He had laid waste to many nations like Hamath and Arpad, and he lists them. If the gods of the other cities and nations couldn't save them, what evidence is left that your God would be able to save the Judeans? You're a puny small fry against those people. How could you possibly withstand my attack? They had made some alliances earlier with the Egyptians that were going to supply 2,000 horsemen, and he said, you don't even have a single rider that could ride one horse, and you think you're going to withstand my attack. Don't believe your king when he says, the Lord will surely deliver us. Don't believe it. The evidence is going the other way. And then the general made some promises. So he had both a stick and a carrot to encourage them to surrender. So remember, he's speaking so the people on the walls can hear. Make your peace with me and come out to me. And then every one of you will eat from your own vine and your own fig tree and drink water from your own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land. He does tell the truth. He's going to deport them all. Take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Make your peace with me. You will do well. Or this is a nice line. Or you can stay here and be doomed to eat your own dung and drink your own urine. My junior high boys are going to love that line. It's a pretty good promise, isn't it? even if it does contain the truth that they will be deported to a foreign land. Or can we believe these promises? That's the question, isn't it? From the other telling of this story in 2 Kings 19, we hear that Hezekiah was a better king than Judah had had for a while. They had a succession of terrible kings. But he attempted to be a good king, and it says he went to the high places and pulled them down. So the people of, people of Israel and Judah both were tempted by the gods of the land, and so they built their shrines and altar 
their high places, Hezekiah pulled them down and tried to keep them more focused on the worship of the true God. And I think Hezekiah the king handled this classic confrontation amazingly well too, although he must have been terrified. He didn't cower or bluster. It says he was terrified, but he sought out God's help through the prophet Isaiah. He asked the prophet for discernment about God's desires in this conflict. They'd been paying them off. Or should we surrender? What should we do? And Isaiah first said, don't be afraid. And then he proclaimed God's desire that the Assyrians would not prevail. A pretty unlikely promise. All along the Assyrian general had been saying, thus says Sennacherib the king. But now Isaiah says to Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid. I have heard the words with which the servant of the king of Isaiah has reviled and mocked me. And now I will put a spirit in him so that he shall hear a rumor. Incredible that a rumor could end this assault. He will hear a rumor and return to his own land of Assyria and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. And overnight many of the Assyrian soldiers died. There was a rumor apparently that came to the general that things were not good back home and so they pitched their tents and they went home. And finally back home in Nineveh the general's own two sons killed him when he was worshiping his God. And so ended this threat to the city of Jerusalem and the people of God, at least for now. This was 701, 587 B.C. They were conquered. But against all appearances, God through the prophet asked the king and the people to trust that their enemy would not prevail. It's an incredible story. Dramatic, with such strong opposing characters. But I think the crux of the matter, the very heart of the question is this. How can we tell the difference between hope and false hope? between hope and illusion. If you had been the king or just a regular person listening from the top of the wall, what would you have done when you heard the general's threats and promises? He had the people to back him up, it looked like. He had the history to back him up. He had destroyed city after city. Their gods had not protected them. And why should yours? And he did promise that if we surrendered, all would be well. There's no evidence here to trust God's word. In fact, the evidence is all on the other side. The Rabshaka said, don't let your king and prophet deceive you. Give up. You don't have a prayer. You ever felt that? that there were times that you did not have a prayer. We are also tempted to give up. My new friend at the wedding was sure there was no hope. He thought that every single thing he saw said that we're basically going, going to hell in a handbasket. So how do we decide how to live our lives? When are we kidding ourselves, and when should we hope? I think it's all about whom we trust. How do we trust who is speaking? I believe because of God's track record for finding amazing ways, and we've been hearing these stories all the way from Abraham and Joseph and Moses from flood, from slavery, from exile, in our own lives too, we can trust God. 
the stories you heard from your parents and grandparents that you have in your own life that said, God came through for me. God is the one that I will trust. Who do we listen to? Because God has a longer, more trustworthy resume of keeping promise, promises, God is the one we should be listening to. Now there will be voices that speak louder than God and who try to make you fearful. They are shouting loudly right now. I always ask what these speakers want out of this when they try to make us afraid. The general wanted an easy victory. In this last election, people that are advertising and are fear mongers want your money or your vote. And God's first words are, do not be afraid. Now while telling people to be afraid does not automatically make all fear appear. This is a counter narrative. It's pushing back over a narrative that is so strong that it's all about fear. Do not be afraid is the word of truth in the midst of lies. We must proclaim this word to one another again and again. I'd like you to just face your neighbor, just turn to your neighbor, and please say to them, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. This is a word that we should be saying to each other a lot. And we should say, thus says the Lord, don't be afraid. Finally, in Isaiah, and if you saw the scriptures, it loops back from 36 and 37, back to 2, chapter 2, to an incredible prophecy. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house, that's Jerusalem, shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and all will come to it to learn and to walk in his paths. For, the, for God will judge the nations with righteousness, and they will reforge their swords into garden hose, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. If the first part of the reading and my sermon have been about the real historical happening on some days during 701 B.C. in Jerusalem, here is a prophecy of what God wants to do in the world. To go beyond warfare, violence, and brutality to another kind of world. Wars are about fear. God's mission for the world is in contrast to fear. A different frame of reference entirely. A different way of looking at the world. In this way of looking at the world, God is at the center. And Isaiah draws attention away from the gaze on military might and fear and toward the coming rule of God. Do I think that war will end and even change great, greatly in my lifetime or my children's or grandchildren's? Perhaps not. I don't think war is going to go away right away. But if we have no vision, no hope of a different tomorrow, how can we work toward it? And this is not any kind of put down of veterans at all. You have served proudly and boldly. But cannot we dream of a day when our great grandsons and daughters don't have to go to war? At the wedding last summer, my new friend said the world is going to hell in a handbasket. That is not a Christian view of the world. It is not the witness of faith in a God who has delivered us from bondage repeatedly. Shown his divine love by sending us Jesus Christ. And promised the renewal of all things. Living in fear is not a Christian witness. Today, instead, God asks that we trust in him 
and let go of our fear. And instead, and we're coming here to Advent, which is the season above all in the year that we cultivate hope. For we can trust our God that his will for us is not death, but life. Not fear, but hope. Amen. We're moving directly to the sharing of the peace. Would you please stand as you are able? As members of God's household, I pray the peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace with one another. And then we receive the offering.
we continue with our communion, we want you to know we have an open table of communion, so we would like you to join us as God welcomes us to his table. Please stand as you are able for the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right It is indeed our duty and our joy that we should at all times and all places give thanks and praise to to God. By the witness of the saints, you show us the hope of our calling and strengthen us to run the race set before us, that we may delight in your mercy and rejoice with them in glory. And so with all the saints, with the choirs of angels and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Our Lord Jesus, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Please stand as you are able for the final blessing. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you that you have brought us here and refreshed us. There are many who would shout fearful fearful messages to us. But Lord, you are the one who gives us hope. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Now go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.